Hello everyone. So uh, I know that normally I would not do this, um, but um, in uh, class yesterday uh, for CIS 311, I started the Zoom meeting, but I think I for either I forgot to hit record or Zoom ate the recording. And as I explained at the beginning of the semester, you know this is this is not a distance education course. It's something that I do as a convenience for students, and you know I'm not going to go back and re-record things generally. But um, the lecture portion is not going to be re-recorded. But there were examples in class um, that I think are potentially essential. Um, if you uh, if you don't see them, you have a harder time with Lab Three. So I'll, I at least want to make sure that I record those examples and explain them so that you can reference them later if need be when you're doing your own labs. Uh, one of them we actually saw, it was partially recorded, almost, I mean, indeed, mostly recorded on the Thursday prior to Tuesday's class, but um, since we didn't get quite to the end of it, there was one more piece that we were missing. Um, that one, you, you have some idea of what to do, but we are going to start with that one, and then we're going to move on to the second one. So the first example here is going to be an example of a return to libc exploit. Um, so we have a, a, a binary that will be... Well, uh, let me show you the make file, I suppose. It might make more sense. All right, so... We have two examples, one and two. Um, they're non-position independent executables, and there is no stack canary, so we don't have to worry about any of those things. But notice that there is dep enabled. Depnx is enabled on these binaries. If we take a look at the source code here for the first one, and the second one, more or less, they're, they're very similar. So we're including standard I.O. We have a main function. We declare a buffer, 16 bytes. We fill that buffer, and then we return. Very little code here to actually work with in terms of available exploits. But we do have a buffer, and we do have user input, which means that we have something potentially available to us. And what we're going to be doing, if you refer to the slides that we went over on Thursday, essentially what we're going to be doing here for our return to libc example is we are uh, going to be using that opportunity to provide input to the application to essentially uh, call areas of memory outside of the code that we have written so code that's available through the standard c library in order to assemble a payload and execute a shell uh, let's go to the example and i'll break it down for you so this should look familiar Right, we did, uh, did this partially on Thursday, um, and uh, what we were doing at the time uh, is we had to make some adjustments because when this example was created, it was run on one system, but now we're executing on another. Uh, but this is a non-position independent executable, so we just need to essentially find our new, I guess I should say, new memory addresses for the components that we need to find, uh, and then uh, we should be we should be just fine. We don't have to worry about those changing. So we can essentially do static analysis on this binary, and we can assemble a payload based upon our individual circumstances. So um, we already did this in class, but now I'm on a different system here, um, recording this separately. So uh, we're essentially going to do this uh, from the beginning again. So what we need uh, in order to make this work is we're going to need a return a pop RDI gadget, and we're going to need to find um, a shell call and a system call in the available code. So let's start out with our return and pop RDI. So we're going to run ROPPER, and we're going to run ROPPER on, this is 1.bin. Uh, here is a return all by itself, so that's perfect. 40101A, 40101A. Okay, we're good there. Now we're looking for a pop RDI. So here's pop RDI return right here. 4011C3, 4011C3. Okay. So we don't have to make any adjustments. Uh, the locations of those off offsets within the code are going to be the same. I expect that because even though we're on a different system, the binary is the same, and that's what we're analyzing right now. So let's run this through GDB and see if we can locate our system uh, call and bin shell. So gdb one dot bin let's break main and let's run it we hit our breakpoint okay we're good 
So now we should be able to search for system in the symbols table. And indeed we are able to do so. So this location here in libc is the location of a of system, the system call. And it is different slightly than the one we have in our example, so it's good that we were able to find that. Now this is about where we left off on Thursday's example, if you were watching that lecture. Um, I could not recall at the moment the, the command to, to search and print the location of certain strings. I tried a bunch of different commands that I, that I had available, and I just couldn't find it at the time. But I was able to find it after, as promised. And what we're looking for is search pattern, and then we want to enter the string after that. So we're looking for somewhere within our code where it is uh, expressing a bin shell. And here's our location. Um, here's the starting memory address and the ending memory address. It is seven bytes away because one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we need the beginning address here. And we'll put that here in our example. So seven F F F F F seven F six one O four F. Um, I'm going to execute this locally because this is not running on our target machine, so this will just be a local exploit. So if it works, we can we should be able to drop into an interactive shell, and when we enter a command, it shouldn't seg fault. We should be able to. We're essentially going to be in a stable shell if we execute this, at least if it's working. So I'm going to save this. Let's exit GDB and uh, let's let's run it. See what we get. And there we have it. Okay, so we're in a stable shell. So that worked just fine. The shell that we're in right now was created when bin shell was called and then executed. Um, and uh, our assemblage of payloads, or our payload here, rather, uh, if we break this down, we have a 16 byte buffer. So if we want. Uh, to overflow that, we're going to need to, of course, fill the 16 bytes and then plus 8, right? That gets us past our base pointer. Um, then we have packed 64, the address for our return. So the return gets called. Then we have a packed 64 pop RDI. Again, that's within our own code. So that address gets packed in there and then the pop RDI gets called. Then we have packed 64 bin shell. And then we have a PAC64 system. Both of those are just pointers to the locations of that code in the C library, which of course is available to us. And then we have a return because we're using PSend instead of SendLine. So that's what we're doing, but maybe um, an illustration might, might help a bit. So uh, let, me, uh, let me see if we can draw this out and maybe help your understanding. I think I'm using this enough these days that I would actually set up the document camera or tablet or something, but um, apparently not. Okay, so I'm going to cordon... Uh, that's not thick enough. I'm going to cordon off an area here. No depth and X. Okay, so this is what we had been doing roughly up until this point in the semester. Okay. Here is our stack frame. I'm going to have it low to high here. And here is a section for buff when we declare our buffer variable. Later on, we're going to have a gets that's going to allow us to fill that. And before we do any meddling, we have a return address. And the way that everything is supposed to go, let me switch to red here, uh, is that we fill our buffer with whatever the application is requesting. Uh, the program gets that uh, and uh, then returns back to wherever. Actually, let me use green here uh, for the, the actual operation. So we, uh, we fill this up uh, and uh, we get here. It returns and we end up back I don't know, wherever wherever we originally coming from, either we exit, or if we are calling a function from main, it returns to main. Okay? That's how it's supposed to work. 
what we've been oops <laughs> what we've been doing so far however uh, is we've been sending in far too many A's All right this would actually be uh, double A times 12 here and that actually fills up all of this right so we overflow that and then we no longer have return address all right so this is one of our examples from the uh, one of our first units the buffer overflow unit <clears throat> what we had was we had a function that we wanted to call even though it wasn't referenced at all in in main and we had a similar situation where we had a 16 byte buffer so what we did is we overflowed our buffer in order to get to our return address. We overwrote that with the pointer to the function that was never called. And then instead of returning back to, you know, exit or returning back to main if we were inside another function, it instead jumped to the function that we were looking to call. Um, it, so in that case, we didn't use any shellcode, but I mean, it, it, we could have uh, pointed to shellcode because without dep nx, um, there is no... Uh, no, no mechanism to stop us from executing code out of pl places in memory where we would normally never need to do that. That's the whole point of DEP NX is that it, in, it enables ACLs over uh, pages of memory that restrict uh, how it can be used. So with DEP NX, how do we overcome that? Okay, well, what we have done, here's a stack frame here for us. Again, Here's a uh, buffer, here's our base pointer. Um, so again, here's our buff, 16 bytes. Normally it's gonna contain this, return address, all right. And instead of adding a shell code down here, we can't, doesn't make any sense. We, we won't be able to execute it out of this location because of uh, deb nx because there's other areas of memory that uh, that are executable. This is not one of them. Uh, we can write to this, but we can't actually execute code out of this area of memory. So there's another area of memory here somewhere else. So we're going to call uh, this stack frame where we're at. This will be this will be write and read. And this up here will be execute and read. Okay, and what this area is going to contain is it's going to contain all of our code. And it's also going to contain the code that we haven't written, but which we need to have access to, like those that are available in libc. Uh, libc is, uh, so just like in Windows, ntdll.dll is basically available in every running process on a Windows system. libc is equally the same sort of thing for, for binaries in Linux and other operating systems. So it's always essentially available. It's essential system code. All right, so what we want to do um, is, first of all, we want to create a chain of events here which will allow us to execute um, code in areas of memory in the right order to produce the result that we're looking for. So we start off, overwrite our buffer, all right? So we, we fill everything up here and overwrite our return address. And our return address is a gadget that we find somewhere in our application, which will bring us back, instead of returning back to where, from whence we came, instead, um, so let's do this here, let's say, uh, we so here, in a normal operation, this would take us back up here again for the exit, but instead, uh, we're having it bounce up somewhere and then back down here where we have the address to another gadget, pop RDI. A pop instruction places whatever is on the top of the stack into the identified register. So when we pop RDI, whatever is on top of the stack, uh, we'll do yellow for this. Um, whatever's on top of the stack will be 
uh, essentially placed into RDI here. What do we want in RDI? Well, that's where we want the instruction that we want to be executed. All right, so we uh, go out and we find our useful code in an area that can be executed. And so we find somewhere here in libc a command that identifies our shell program. So start bin shell. And so this will be that. We're referencing a pointer to a location in an executable area of memory. Okay, uh, next we point to a call to a system. But again, this is executable code. So we have to go looking for it somewhere where we can execute that code. So we find that. So then what ends up happening here in the end? Well, well, we'll step through it here with our debugger and I'll show you. All right, so don't forget, this is our chain of events. We're sending 24 A's. Then we are adding an address to return. Then we're adding a pointer to a pop RDI gadget. Then we're pointing to bin shell in an area of code far removed from where we currently are. And the same for system. Now we can step through this and we'll see how it looks. Okay, so I've uh, I've added a line here to our script to start a uh, start the debugger when we execute this, so that we can step through the application as we watch it go. So uh, here we are, right at the the beginning of our application here. Uh, let's see if we hit run. I'm going to put a breakpoint at main and let's continue. All right, we've gotten to our, our breakpoint. I'm going to set another breakpoint here, and I'm going to set it at... Uh, so I want to set it after the gets. Um, here we are at the top of main. I'm going to set our breakpoint to after gets. Uh, so this will be just after our payload is injected, so we can see the state of the stack at the beginning of this process. I'm going to set a breakpoint here for 401153. And let's continue. And now we should hop to just after we have done our payload injection. And yes, here we can see the 4141414. Those are the A's that we sent. We can see that just after we get done sending our A's, so here's all of our A's, we've overwritten, well, so the buffer's full, and we've overwritten our base pointer right here at uh, DE30. Our next line, DE38, is our reference to 40101A, which is our return gadget. After that, we have a reference to pop RDI, which is 4011C3, which is our next address to the gadget. After that, we have a reference to this memory address, right? Up this, this upper level here, um, which we can see here translates to this hex string or is translated to ASCII right after that as bin shell. So we put that on the stack. And then the last thing we have here is a call to system right here at uh, the other memory address. We can see here's a system plus zero, so the top of system, where the first thing we have here is a test RDI. This is why we needed a pop RDI to put our bin shell statement into that register, because RDI is the destination instruction register. So when we do a system call, it looks to that register for the parameters. So what, what are we sending to system? And system is system constant character command. So it's looking for us to call system, parenthesis, parenthesis, and then a command in between, as you, you might have guessed just from looking at it. So let's follow this uh, and see what happens, all right? So right now, our instruction pointer is at main 29, where we're zeroing out EAX. And then after that, we have a leave and a return. It should be the end of our program. It's done, right? We're about to get to the epilogue of our function, and the program is elegantly shutting down, right? But we have overwritten the base pointer and it's going to go to the next instruction. There's going to be our return. So here we are, here's our leave. And after our leave, we have our return. And where are we returning to? Well, the, the address that's next in memory is 40101A. That's our return that we placed on the stack. 
OK. So if we hit another next instruction, we should be jumping to, so uh, it's going to return back to where we are now. And our next instruction should be uh, to jump to that pop RDI gadget right here, 4011C3. So we're not, we haven't filled RDI yet. If we come up and, and look, RDI is, it's got a pointer in it, but there's, it's pointing to nothing right now. It's been zeroed out. Um, so there's nothing in there. But what will be popped into RDI? Well, it'll be our next instruction, whatever is next on the stack, which is this right here at DE48. So let's, let's do that. All right, so indeed, here we are at 4011C3. We're on a pop, a pop RDI instruction. It shouldn't be filled yet, and it's not. But when we hit next instruction, that's the instruction that's going to be executed, is that pop RDI. So when we pop RDI, now RDI has been, so the data on top of the stack, bin shell, has now been placed into RDI. Our next instruction here is that test RDI RDI, which we know is at system plus zero at the top of our syscall. It's going to check RDI and say, okay, what command do you want me to execute? I'm going to execute whatever is in RDI. And in this case, it's been a shell. So there we have stepped again. Here's the test RDI. That's the, we're now at the top of system. You can see the memory address here is 17920. 17920. So we have jumped back to system and we execute. You can see here uh, the reference for RDI here is the memory address pointing to bin shell, right? So 17923 is here. So it's pointing to this command. So it's just executing that command. If we hit control, C, or sorry, if we exit out of our debugger, all right, well, and there we go. So we have, we have reached the end, our payload was injected, and uh, that's, that's how it works, right? We're just redirecting the flow of the application and guiding it with gadgets to the code that we want it to do because we can't execute code within our own stack frame. We have to reference code outside of it. All right, here we have our uh, second example. Just like the first one, it's basically just declaring a buffer, gets a buffer, and then returns, except we have two other things. Uh, we have, number one, a variable that's declared after our main function for bin shell. It just adds bin shell to our code. Um, and then we also have a function here, easyrop, which serves no practical purpose, but essentially contains an account of just about every gadget you could ever want for pretty much anything. This is obviously a best case scenario kind of a thing, and there's no reason for this to be in the code. But in general, remember that generally programs are going to be hundreds of thousands or even millions of lines of code. So the odds of them containing a plethora of gadgets up to and potentially including our syscall here um, are, you know, not bad. You, know, you may not always have everything, but uh, you're going to usually have more than you ha can find with Ropper in our tiny six to ten line examples so far. Right? So uh, what this is going to be an example of is not a return to libc. This is an example of ROP chaining, right? So it, what if we, uh, for whatever reason, aren't able to, or a second idea, I suppose. Because, I mean, technically in this example, we could do a return to libc, right? That's all still available to us, and it will still work. But if we wanted to use code assembled from um, our, our own program without having to reach out to to external libraries this is another way that we could do that right so if we look at our example here um, we're we've, we're doing the same thing we start the process up and then we have a ROP chain that is created the ROP chain is essentially a reference to different gadgets um, that um, just as we saw with the last example uh, assemble instructions in memory uh, to essentially cause the program to execute commands that simply aren't there, right? We're, we're grabbing instructions and we're assembling them and manipulating the data in memory so that we eventually achieve our result, which is in this case to um, uh, execute a shell, right? So uh, let's uh, do this here one at a time. So um, the first thing that we're, so, and then at the end, we just send the, the whole payload here in a chain. So it's really the chain that contains our payload. 
All right, so uh, what are we doing here? Okay, so the first thing we're doing is we are popping RAX. So a pop, again, is going to put whatever is at the top of the stack into uh, RAX. So when we call that pop, what will be placed into RAX? A hex 3B, so a sys exec VE, which we talked about in class last week. So basically going to put our call here um, in RAX. Uh, next, we grab a pop RDI. What's going to be popped into RDI? Well, we have a pointer here to bin shell, just as we did in the last example. So we want that in our in our destination index register. In RSI, what are we putting in RSI? Well, we want to put a zero in there, right? So we have a pop RSI, and we put a zero on top of the stack so that this zero gets popped into RSI. And then after that, we have a, or alternatively, we could just Zor ESI in order to uh, to zero it out. We could also do as we do here uh, for the next example, if we have a sub ESI ESI. Um, but since we need a zero in our D register as well, we put a zero on the stack and find a pop RDX gadget. And then we end it all with a syscall as such here. Let's see where we can find these things in memory first off, right? So if we run ropper on 2.bin, we're going to see we have a whole lot more gadgets than we did before, okay? Because we have essentially all of them sitting there in the code itself. So here at 401162, there is a syscall. It's also attached to move rex, rex, and return, but we can just reference the syscall right here at the same address. So 401162 and 401162 is where we find that. We're looking for a pop RDX. So we'll go up to the pops or we could search, we could search for it. Uh, but here we go, pop RDX at 4012AA. Uh, pop RSI, uh, 4012AC and we have a pop RDI 4012 AE. That's the same. And then a pop RAX. We go 4012 A4. Okay. Um, how do we know where the bin shell is? Well, we can do as we did with the last example, uh, and we can do a search for it. So let's break main and run it. And let's search pattern. And what we should have here is two references, one bin shell in libc, as we just saw, and one bin shell in our own code because the, the programmer wrote that into the source code for some reason. And we do. So here is the reference in libc at the same memory address or same offset as we saw before. And here is the one referenced in our own code at 404030 and 404030. So that memory address is the same. All right, so that's where bin shell can be found. All right, so um, let's, uh, let's do a diagram here. All right, so here's our stack frame, just as before. There's our buffer. There's our return address. Okay, and basically what we're doing is we are overwriting our buffer. All right, so we're filling all of this up with A's, getting rid of this. Okay, and then we're adding instructions afterwards. All right, so we basically uh, go into our code and we say here is going to be a pop R A X and we're popping into RAX3B. So what happens when we execute that? Let me, uh, all right, let me show the state of the registers here as we go. So we put this into there. Uh, next, we have a reference to bin shell, a pointer, I should say, to it. RDI then contains bin shell. Okay, then we put a zero into RSI and rdx and then last just gonna <laughs> just gonna kind of divide up memory here a little bit and last we add a syscall here at the end okay so now um why does it need to be essentially as such 
if we look at the uh, syntax here for the exec VE, uh, executes the program referred to by path name. This causes the program that is currently being run by the calling process to be replaced with the new program with newly initialized stack, heap, and data segments. The syntax here is exec VE, path name, argv, environment p. So two, param so two parameters are sent along with it. All right, so the way that this should look here at the end uh, is when this is all called, our final command here should look as the syntax demands. Parentheses here. Oops. Bin shell, comma, zero. Zero as parameters. And then it gets executed. Okay. Um, let's switch this out and we'll start the script here. In our debugger, and we'll watch all of this happening as we go. Okay, I'm going to break main. <coughs> and uh, let's continue. And once again, I'm going to add another breakpoint for just after our gets, which again is 501153. Or 401153, sorry. All right, then let's continue, and this should be just after our payload is delivered. Okay, again, we see the A's, so we know that that's the case. And if we look below our A's here in the stack, we can see, yes, indeed, uh, there's easy ROP, so we're referring to that, uh, that easy ROP function within our own code, which is why we put it there. Um, so we have a pop RAX, as we saw. After that, we have our 3B. Then we have our pop RDI with bin shell. We can see that coming up, and here's our pop RSI, and that's as far as we can see in the view we currently have. So let's, let's step through, and uh, what we should do is we should have our, our pop RAX coming up, but right now we're at a move, a zero into EAX. EAX currently contains um, some A's from our um, payload. All right, so we've moved zero into EAX, so that's been zeroed out. And our next command should be a, this is our epilogue, so we should see the, the leave and return. And normally we would be done, except when we return, the address we're going to return to is not going to be a an exit. It's going to be our pop RAX, so leave. And now when we return, we start calling the gadgets in our chain. So into RAX we're going to place the semicolon, or 3B, I should say. There we go. So we've just popped RAX, and indeed we have 3B there in that register. Now we are going to pop RDI, which should put our bin shell into our destination index. Our di here indeed now contains bin shell. Okay. Next we have our pop rsi, which should zero that and uh, give us a zero for the final command. Uh, there we have a zero. We also already have a zero in rdx, so apparently we don't need to zero that out, but it's already in our chain, so we're going to go ahead and do that. So that was our pop RDX, and it did contain a zero before, so that's not technically a change, although we did just zero it out to be sure. And now uh, we have a uh, reference to just a syscall. Okay, so when we do our return here, which right now we're, we're technically still in easy ROP because we're on the return end of our last pop statement here. So when we return, it says here we're going to return to 401162 which is our syscall. So let's jump to that. Okay, so here's our syscall. Let's run that. Process 1029909 is executing a new program. All right, there we go. Now let's run it and we'll uh, do a little bit of a test here. I'm going to replace our debug 
statement here with our regular process. Let's execute it again. And indeed we have it. So there we go. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. And uh, please do email me if you have any problems or questions, if you, things still aren't clear, um, either now or before your uh, assignment is due on Sunday for Lab 3. Uh, but do remember that if you wait until the, the very last minute to contact me, I can't guarantee um, I'm not sitting on my computer just waiting for emails to roll in on the weekend. So, um, you know, get to me sooner if you're having trouble than later. And if you're waiting to the last minute, you're taking a risk that you won't get help if you need it. Okay. So take care and have a good and safe spring break. And we'll see you when you come back. All right. Goodbye.